from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Skills on point. Then he'll point, and when he points, he just freezes in, in spot, and he looks like a statue. See some of the top bird dogs in the country in action. The U.S. is the top ag exporter, but could another country soon be moving in on that number one spot? As the grain markets push lower after another report from USDA. That was a surprise. What it has to say about South American crop production right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the testing grounds meet the proving grounds. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Quentin Griffiths. A new supply demand report from USDA shows new concerns about U.S. export demand. The agency calling for unchanged or lower exports of wheat, corn, and soybeans. Taking a look at the latest ending stocks numbers, all three, corn, soybeans, and wheat, were higher than what the trade had predicted. Corn at 2.1 billion bushels, which is 50 million bushels lower than last month. The agency forecasting higher corn use for ethanol, but unchanged numbers for exports. For soybeans, ending stocks are raised 25 million bushels to 340 million on lower exports. And for wheat, 698 million bushels, up 25 million from last month. And again, no change to exports. USDA making some small changes to South American crop production numbers, lowering corn production in Argentina due to a decline in yield expectations because of drought, but only by 1 million metric tons. No change to the country's soybean crop size, and it made no changes at all to Brazil's forecast for corn and soybeans. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins me with reaction to this report. And Michelle, the numbers pushed grains lower on Thursday. Yeah, Clinton, the market was disappointed with the April WASDE, especially when it came to South American production numbers. USDA basically kicked the can down the road again on both Argentina and Brazil, corn and soybean production, and their numbers are still well above CONAB and other private estimates. USDA left Brazil soybeans unchanged at 155 million metric tons and corn at 124 million, while CONAB lowered Brazil's soybean crop to 146.5 million and the corn to just under 111 million. Market analysts say that's a huge difference. That was a surprise. I mean, CONAB's been very, very aggressive cutting the crop in Brazil. Um, the Argentinian exchanges are doing the exact same thing, Michelle, and the USDA literally punted. They left their estimate for the corn crop in Brazil, the bean crop in Brazil, the bean crop in Argentina, all unchanged to the surprise of the trade. They did lower the Argentina corn crop by a million metric tons, but they're still way above where the uh, you know South American exchanges are. In fact, Wednesday, the Rosario Grain Exchange cut Argentina's corn crop six and a half million metric tons. So when will USDA lower the South American crop and why the big discrepancy? Historically, the USDA tends to walk down their numbers. So the fact that they're above these other South American, you know, estimates is not a surprise. But like I said, the fact they didn't make any revisions at all, because all accounts, especially the corn crop down in Argentina, you're hearing a lot of problems with disease and bug pressure. And then even the Brazilian corn crop, the Safrina crop, it's doing okay. But you have heard of certain areas that definitely had dealt with some extreme heat and a lack of lack of rain. So I would anticipate this crop to get smaller down the line. It's just a matter of when, I guess, in the USDA's you know, I viewpoint. He says U.S. inning stocks estimates were slightly disappointing for corn as USDA raised ethanol and feed demand, but just not as much as expected. The revision was only about an upward revision of total demand by 50 million. The trade was looking for closer to 70, 75 million. So it was a step in the right direction, Michelle, but just not what the bulls wanted to see. USDA also raised soybean ending stocks by 25 million bushels by lowering exports, while the agency raised wheat ending stocks 25 million as well. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. Why is China buying less U.S. ag product right now? In an interview with Bloomberg, U.S. Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack suggesting the reduction in purchases by China may be linked to recent actions taken by the U.S., such as restrictions on foreign ownership of American farmland. Vilsack saying China's agriculture minister recently mentioned to him Arkansas's enforcement of legislation forcing a Chinese-controlled company, Syngenta AG, to sell farmland. Now, Vilsack highlighted that China's purchases of U.S. agricultural products have decreased by $6 billion compared to the previous year. 
One place we know China is turning to for ag is Brazil. And Brazil's booming cropland could expand 45% or 70 million acres in the years ahead. That's according to analysts at FarmDoc through the University of Illinois. Analysts say the growth could be done by converting overgrazed and overgrown pasture land, especially in key agricultural states like Mato Grosso, which you see on this map, and has the potential to convert more than 12 million acres of land. They also suggested that by intensifying land use for the safrina crop, which is the second crop of corn, that could also expand acreage. Currently, safrina corn, which is planted after soybeans, occupies about 40% of the land used for growing soybeans. But there are some big challenges to overcome, including fuel and fertilizer costs, along with an overburdened transportation system. Happening right now, several states are taking measures in an effort to stop the spread of avian flu in dairy cattle. A total of 17 states are now enforcing bans on the entry of dairy cattle from states where bovine influenza A virus cases have been confirmed. Now you see those states highlighted on this map and just announced the virus has been detected in a South Dakota dairy herd. It represents the 22nd case and the eighth state with an outbreak of the virus. So far, the Federal Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service has stated that it will not issue federal quarantine orders. It is also not recommending any state regulatory quarantines or official hold orders on cattle. Instead, APHIS strongly advises minimizing cattle movement as much as possible and is discouraging the transportation of sick or exposed animals. Severe storms brought tornadoes, heavy rain, flood water rescues and power outages from Louisiana to Florida on Wednesday. In Slidell, Louisiana, crews are surveying damage from a possible tornado. St. Tammany Parish officials say several people went to the hospital with injuries from those storms. The same system spun off a confirmed tornado in Katy, Texas and another in Port Arthur. And more rain is on the way for the Midwest. Meteorologist Martin Lorimore joins us with an update. Martin. And we're watching as of right now, two low pressure systems, one making its way out of the US and one that will be moving its way through over the next couple of days. So let's start with the one on its way out first. Now it's making its way across the eastern seaboard. You can see a lot of that rain, a lot of the stronger storms that actually passed by parts of the southern US had tornadoes actually in parts of Louisiana, Alabama, seeing those with this system. Now, luckily, it is now long gone. That cold front associated with it now off of the coast of the Atlantic Ocean, continuing its way out of here could still see some additional rainfall across the Appala across the Appalachia, but we're already paying our closer attention to the next low pressure system. It's going to be bringing in some rain and a little bit of snow across the Sierra Nevadas for at least the next couple of days into our Saturday and Sunday. But this low will be passing its way through the center of the U.S. and it could bring in some stronger storms as we get into the first couple of days of our work week. So it's something we'll be keeping our very close eye on as we get into our next work week. And planters are starting to roll in parts of the country. Miles Smith from Fairfax, Missouri, saying, let's go farming, boys. He's clearly ready to get some corn seed in the ground. Good luck to Miles and good luck to all of you farmers getting that in the ground. I'll have more in your forecast coming up. The EPA is announcing its first ever limits for several common types of PFAS or so-called forever chemicals in drinking water. Two types, P. FOA and PFOS will be limited to four parts per trillion. That's the lowest level that tests can reliably detect. The agency says it will reduce exposure for 100 million people and prevent thousands of illnesses, including cancer. It's expected to cost about $1.5 billion annually. Well, utilities groups, however, say the EPA is underestimating the rules cost and overestimating its benefits, arguing water rates will go up and struggling utilities will only struggle more. And the American Farm Bureau Federation says the new regulation will disproportionately impact small communities, which lack the resources of large metro systems, but will still be on the hook to pay for the cost of treating water for PFAS chemicals. Mark is reacting to the USDA report on Thursday, so where do we go from here? We'll discuss it next in Markets Now. And these working dogs get their day in the sun. We're off to Tennessee for the annual bird dog trials in the country. Corn, soybeans, and wheat all in red on Thursday after the release of the latest supply demand report. Michelle Rook is back with more in Markets Now. 
grains out lower on Thursday after the April was day. John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing is back with us. John, really not a lot for the Bulls in the WASD report, especially when it came to those South American numbers. What a disappointment. Even though analysts' expectations, as well as some of the you know, grain exchanges in Brazil and Argentina have brought those crops down, the USDA just kind of holds up, you know, basically holds serve here at this time frame. Did lower the Argentina crop by a million tons. You know, so there's still some room there, uh, obviously, for them to make some adjustments, at least right now, though. They just want to kind of hold hold place and then see if how things continue to develop. I still think the planted acreage area or the planted area down there is one of those big question marks. Probably the main reason the USDA doesn't really want to make a move until they have a better grasp of where that is at harvest. Oh, let's talk about domestic numbers as well. We did get a cut in corn ending stocks by 50 million bushels, but the market was expecting a little bit more than that while we saw increases in ending stocks for both soybeans and wheat, didn't we? Nothing big for the bulls in that. I classified the corn report as relatively neutral. You go to the soybean side of the equation. That was disappointing seeing that 20, uh, 20 million bushels come off that export demand, throw in there some movements on the residual side to get that extra carryover well above what the market was anticipating. But again, grain stocks, we found some extra bushels of, of soybeans out there. So that had to get worked into the balance sheet to some level. I think the surprise maybe in terms of the three grains was the was the 30 million bushel cut on feed usage but and the wheat market, you know, in terms of that. You know, but you got to understand, wheat's competing against a cheaper level of corn price right now. So it was not the best technical day on Thursday either for corn or beans with some new lows for the move, right? Yeah, again, the price action on Thursday was just kind of tough. You know, we actually had outside day trading ranges finishing towards the bottom of the range on the corn market. New low for the move in the soybean market. Looks like we broke some support or, you know, a couple of days ago there as well. You know, just right now the funds are in control. The money flow is in control. If I'm somebody who's on the wants to be a buyer of uh, any of these grains at this time frame, there's really no urgency here to step into this marketplace. And when you get that type of environment, the path of least resistance is still a slippery slope lower. Thanks for joining us, John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing. We'll have more ag day. Yeah, we're looking at severe weather potential in a part of the country that doesn't normally see it very often, the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, parts of Oregon and Idaho and even into northern Nevada seeing the possibility for some of those stronger storms, damaging winds, large hail, even the brief possibility of a possible spin up or two. Now we're not expecting widespread severe weather, but this area shaded in yellow right here could be seeing that higher chance as we're seeing a low pressure system pulling its way off the Pacific Ocean could bring in some brief strong weather for our Friday. So keep a watch out if you're going to be in the Pacific Northwest. You might be encountering some of that uh, wintry weather as well. So as we look, you can see the snowfall estimates very light in the northern portions of the Rockies near Idaho and parts of Montana. This is going to continue to really stay mostly dry. We're almost wrapping up our snow season. Hopefully going to be seeing the end of that. Now there could be with this low pressure system passing by noticing out toward the Sierra Nevada some more of that snowfall starting to pop in just south of Carson City. So higher elevations still going to get that snowfall a couple more inches there. Not really much just to be surprised, but luckily the plains not seeing any more of that snowfall. So those of you in the plains getting ready for that farming Temperatures staying above freezing, but doesn't mean you're going to be free of the rainfall. Oh, no, no. You'll be seeing plenty of that rainfall across a mainly right now. Going to be seeing the Great Lakes and parts of New England seeing upwards to an inch, maybe two inches in some places. But with this next low pressure system making its way through, going to bring in that moisture across the Pacific Northwest. This will eventually trickle its way into the central part of the country with this low pressure. So there's that low pressure on its way out for our afternoon of our Friday and Saturday. There's this next low. This one's where it watched him pretty closely. As it scoots across the way of the Rockies, it's going to bring in the possibility for some stronger storms in the central part of the U.S. I'm talking Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas on Monday. And as this low pressure makes its way across, could bring in some stronger weather out toward Illinois near Chicago. So, again, next couple of days, as opposed to that Monday and Tuesday, keep a close eye out for some stronger storms. Fairfax, Missouri, temperatures high 69, sunny. Big Lake, Texas, a little bit warmer, sitting upper. 70s and low 80s feeling pretty good there partly cloudy and then Pawtucket Rhode Island rainy high 59. A good business idea could win you $100,000 in startup money. We'll have details next and later these hardworking bird dogs are competing for best in the business. We're off to the volunteer state.
in the country. A group called McKinsey and Company is rolling out a survey of farmers regarding sustainable practices. Now the research and survey of 500 growers shows that 90% of farmers understand quote sustainable farming. However, activating that knowledge isn't as widespread. McKinsey and Company saying even where farmers are adopting sustainable practices, they are only being implemented on about 30% of their acreage. It also found that widespread adoption is on practices with a perceived return on investment. The authors say, given the importance of ROI, they recommend more focus on education and data to support those decisions. And Rural Lifestyle Dealer Magazine reporting on the Soul Track Electric Tractor. It spoke with a former dealer of the equipment who says they were a dealer for several years and yet never sold a unit. According to parent company Ideonomics, Soltrack saw a net loss of $16 million in 2022. The dealer telling the magazine at that size tractor, a 25 horsepower equivalent, they aren't sure the market will pay extra for an electric version, adding that there are still likely niche applications where an EV tractor does make sense. No doubt a lot of innovation happens on the farm. Now there's a chance your good idea could be worth $100,000 in startup money. The American Farm Bureau, in partnership with Farm Credit, opening up its 2025 Ag Innovation Challenge. It's looking for entrepreneurs to compete this summer. Individuals or startup companies with innovative solutions serving farmers, ranchers, or rural communities can apply online by June 15th. The winner gets $100,000 in startup funds. The runner-up will receive $25,000, and two other finalists could get $10,000 each. If you make it to the final four, you'll pitch your business idea next January at the AFBF convention in San Antonio. You can get more details over at fb.org. A hardworking bird dog can make a big difference while out on a hunt. We'll see some of the best in the business. Give it a go next in the country. English pointers and English setters, also known as bird dogs, are a beautiful athletic breed who are skilled hunters. For more than a century, Tennessee has hosted the top pointers and setters in the nation to determine who's the alpha dog. The University of Tennessee's Charles Denny shows us these animals in action. The farmland at the UT Ames Ag Research Center includes coveys of quail nesting in the brush. It's hard to spot the birds, but here's who can point you right to them. Note how these dogs halt in a rigid pose, eyes and nose straight ahead, sniffing the air, and directing you right to the hidden quail. He has to evaluate very quickly whether it's body scent or whether it's foot scent, and once he gets that worked out in his mind, then he'll point, and when he points, he just freezes in, in spot, and he looks like a statue. No hunting here, just observing these canines in action the national championship field trial for pointing bird dogs at Ames. 2024 marks the 125th year for the competition, and this UT Ag Research Center has hosted the event more than a century. These beautiful dogs have a sharp sense of smell and they're incredibly fit. Each runs the equivalent of a marathon, covering some 3,000 acres in this competition. The courses, the linear length of the courses are about 12 miles. Now a dog has to be in perfect physical condition to be able to run that because the dog is rimming each field as he comes through that. And so the dog is actually running somewhere between 23 and 25 miles in that three hour time period. Hey bud, hey. Bud is really good at locating birds. His handler says this past champion can handle the physical challenge of this competition easily displaying all the characteristics of a good bird dog. Good nose and, you know, good smart, you know, listens good. And, but the main thing is they got to like it. They got to love what they do. And essentially what you're doing is picking the sire of next year's litters. Um, you are looking for an athlete that is not only very good at finding birds and covering terrain, but listening to his handler as well. Some 30 bird dogs from around the country were part of this three-day event, and all were impressive. When you combine heightened senses with a strong mind and endurance, you get an elite competitor. And here they show their skill 
and take on a challenge. This is Charles Denny reporting. All right, thanks, Charles. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Agda, I'm Clinton Grivis. Have a great day. I'm Farm Country.